and uh, I'm the chair uh, with François Maréchal of the Energy Section of the European Federation of Chemical Engineering. Welcome to this webinar, uh, which is about carbon capture, storage, utilization, and uh, their impact uh, on, the on the path towards uh, a more sustainable future. Uh, this webinar is being organized uh, by Matteo Gazzani and Pano Seferli, who are the, the topic leader on uh, carbon capture and reuse uh, of the energy section. Uh, we have a tight uh, schedule, so I'm not going to use uh, any more time, and uh, I will immediately leave the floor to Giorgio Veronesi. So, Giorgio, the floor is, uh, is yours. Thank you, Fabrizio, I'm, uh, and welcome to everybody to this uh, webinar. I'm uh, Giorgio Veronesi, I'm uh, the Executive Vice President of the European Federation of Chemical Engineering. I've been uh, in the board of uh, EFC for five years, and currently in my second term in this position, where I'm responsible of the operational, economic, and financial matters of the Federation. I'm a chemical engineer by training, graduated in Padova, actually same university and same department of Fabrizio. And I've been spending the whole of my career in the engineering construction business, involved in many projects, mainly abroad, uh, with uh, several assignments uh, overseas. I'm very happy to be involved in the introduction of this webinar on energy. As during my professional life, I had the opportunity to participate to many power initiatives uh, from the development phase to construction and operation. And I'm really interested in such an important uh, subject. Let me say something about this uh, webinar series. EFC is organizing a series of free virtual spotlight talks on significant topics in chemical engineering. 11 of our, of our technical groups, working parties and sections, like the one of energy, are delivering short session of three or four talks by leading industrial and academic experts on chemical reaction engineering, education, energy, this one is the first one of the two of energy, loss prevention and safety promotion, mechanics of particulate solids, mixing, multi-phase fluid flow, process intensification, quality by design, static electricity in industry, thermodynamics and transport properties. Each session will focus on a key subject, but the series enables attendees to sample topics in areas that they find interesting, but they are not otherwise have had the opportunity to attend before. In this way, we want to encourage the cross fertilization between specialist areas. Let me say something about scientific collaboration. The EFC promotes scientific collaboration and supports the work of chemical engineers and collaborating professionals in 30 European countries, representing more than 100,000 chemical engineers in Europe. EFC working parties and sections cover all major specific aspects of chemical engineering and are in fact the core of the organization forming the scientific engine that drives many of EFC activities. They provide an important forum for technical exchange, like this one, and networking among chemical engineers in Europe. Before concluding, I would like to thank all the people who work hard inside the working party and in EFC for this initiative to happen and to be successful. In particular, many thanks uh, in EFC to Martin Poo in Toulouse and Ines Horndorf in Frankfurt, who did most of the conceptual setting up and practical activities for this event. Having said that, I would like to, to thank you for your attention and wish all the speakers and the attendees a fruitful and successful webinar and give back the floor to Professor Matteo Gazzani of Utrecht University to start the works. Thank you. Yes, now you should hear me. I have a few years in experience with the carbon capture, storage and utilization. So I have a few slides. I'll take no more than five minutes to set the scene for our speakers. 
Let me start by looking at the, the history of carbon capture utilization and storage as a CO2 mitigation technology, not as a gas cleaning process, but merely applied to mitigation of CO2 emissions. So the expectations were really high in 1990s and early 2000, when CO2 capture and storage was, a thing, was thought as a device to reduce CO2 emission from the power industry. However, uh, with the financial crisis and the failure of deploying a CO2 capture, expectation decrease, bringing almost to the death to the, this technology. But luckily, thanks to the application of uh, uh, CO2 capture in heavy industry, and also thanks to demonstration plants like Boundary Dam, expectations started to pick up again. And today, uh, especially thanks to the IPCC 1.5 degrees report, it is clear and there are no doubt that CO2 capture and storage and utilization is a key ingredient to, to meet uh, uh, to reach a net zero CO2 emission system. In fact, we can take, for example, we have many studies highlighting this and we can take a famous one, the energy technology perspectives from IEA. I'm showing the 2020 version. And you can clearly see that CCUS uh, has a really important role in the decrease of uh, CO2 emission emissions, CO2 emissions. However, it still remains unclear what is the role of carbon capture and storage versus carbon capture and utilization. And in fact, you will, may, you will often see that they're just naming CCUS. However, they do have very diff many differences. So if you look at carbon capture and storage, it aims at a sort of circularity by using the subsurface. So we take a fossil fuel, we, we send it to a, a plant where we produce a product. The CO2 emissions are taken and sent to the safely stored underground. We might need to use a biomass or a, a direct air capture to really have a fully CO2 and a net zero CO2 emission system. On the other hand, if you look at the carbon capture and utilization, the circularity is achieved without using the subsurface. So we have a natural accumulation of CO2 in the atmosphere, in the oceans, and in the biomass. And that, thanks to artificial extraction of uh, CO2 from these sources, we are able, again, to deliver the same product or service and closing the, the CO2 uh, circle. It is clear that these two systems are very different, and they have far-reaching consequences on the energy system. In fact, on the one hand, if we look at CCS, we start from a fossil fuel, which is, by definition, energy dense. We produce, with a certain loss, a, a product or a service, and finally, we reach the, the stable state of CO2. Fossil fuels, from this perspective, are no more a CO2 net emitter, but issues remain. They need to be, the extraction need to be sustainable, processing as well, and we have to avoid those CO2, CO2 uh, methane emissions. They remain a uh, geopolitical risk and security of supply. On the other hand, if you look at CO, uh, CCU, uh, we will need massive amount of energy to activate the CO2 that we find, uh, that we have extracted, uh, and to produce the product or the service, and finally going back to the, to the CO2. This only makes sense if we take the energy from renewables. Moreover, we will need a new chemistry to uh, use CO2 now as a source uh, to deliver the product. This uh, was a short introduction. We will uh, hear a, a lot more with, uh, with our four speakers. We will start with Nile Shah from Imperial College, followed by Andrea Armirez, Theo Deft, Marco Mazzotti, and uh, Andre Bardo from ETH Zurich. So every uh, speaker will take about 20, 20 minutes, and we will have uh, uh, time for one, two questions. This question should be sent via the question and answer or the chat uh, uh, in a um, system. Finally, we will also have the time and Panos Seferlis will take the lead for our last round of question and uh, conclusion. And with this, I would like to give the floor to Nile Shah for the first talk. Thanks everybody. Great, thank you very much. Uh, and a uh, great introduction. That gives me a good start because I can already uh, use some of what you said in my, in my discussions. So uh, hopefully you can see my screen. And starting with the systems engineering. When you're doing systems engineering, the first thing we're always told is you need to set up the requirements of the system. And one yeah, it's sorry not to interrupt. Be... Yep, sorry. Yeah, uh, we see much more than uh, you. Ah, okay. Yeah, Let me the entire screen. My... Yeah. Let me re-share. 
Is that better? Yes. Yeah. Ah, okay. I pressed the wrong button. Sorry. So in systems engineering, you know, requirements are very important. And sometimes the requirements are not clearly stated for what are we trying to do with CCUS. So, of course, there are many requirements that a CCUS system is meant to help with. Of course, number one normally is stated as decarbonization. But secondly, to help with the penetration of renewable energy and supporting the use of hydrogen, uh, to use new feedstocks like carbon dioxide, to add value to carbon capture. So carbon capture is a cost, so how can we add value to it? And then, of course, uh, when we think about industrial and regional strategy uh, within Europe, we see other dimensions. For example, how do we keep alive some of our big industrial areas? And so wider social and economic aspects also need to be taken into consideration. Industrial competitiveness is a, 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 a big consideration as well. So I think the first thing in systems engineering of CCUS is if I'm thinking about CCUS in a specific country or region, what am I actually trying to achieve? I think that's something that is not always clear and that's the first thing that needs to be clarified. Then of course, when we come to the technical systems engineering, we often like to think in terms of multi-scale perspective of our system. Um, and already, you know, Matteo has mentioned the molecular level of CO2 activation. And this can go all the way up to what we call the infrastructure level, which is around the overall system of how we might move and use and store carbon dioxide. And so I'm going to talk about some of these different levels of the system. And it's easier to think of it in terms of spatial systems and spatial scales. So the way I look at it, there are at least three important spatial scales. Uh, first of all, at a very large, you know, hundreds of kilometer scale, which is, could be a national or international level, where we're trying to look at a macroscopic analysis of how these CCUS systems might evolve and how they might be integrated with wider aspects of the industrial and energy system, for example, the hydrogen system. Then we might also look at the regional level, which might be, for example, a big industrial area, uh, as big maybe as the North Rhine region or you know, more towards the uh, concept of something like Rotterdam, which I'll talk about in a minute. So it's of regional perspective because CCUS, again, can make a lot of sense if certain aspects of infrastructure and cost are shared between different industries rather than each industry just doing its own thing. So again, that's an important systems engineering consideration is integration. And then of course we have the process level. So one exciting thing for me is we will be developing a lot of new process systems. So to reach 1.5 degrees, almost every single industrial process system will have to be re-engineered. So we're going to have to rethink chemical processes. We may make them more efficient. We may electrify them, we may use more hydrogen, use more biomass. We may make new products and services. We're going to, of course, need a lot of carbon capture. The reason being that that will be in energy conversion processes, so power generation, for example. Industrial processes, which are producing both uh, combustion emissions and process emissions. And ultimately, and maybe not in the not too distant future, removing CO2 from the air. CO2 utilization itself is a new process system as well. So for me, I always tell our young undergraduate and master students, they're very lucky to be studying chemical engineering at the age that they're at, because we are going to see a golden age of chemical engineering because of this need to rethink all of our industrial process systems. So just to give a bit of uh, examples of what do I mean by these scales, let me start with a, a national system scale example. So here we're looking at how can we evolve CO2 uh, capture and storage infrastructure for the, uh, for the UK using certain storage sites and make sure that we design a system that evolves over time and which meets the stated targets of the UK government. So some of the systems concepts that we need to think about are where are our big sources of CO2 emissions, where are the likely storage locations, how do we sort of create a nodal system? What is the emissions at each site? What is the storage capacity? How do I then develop infrastructure which allows me to connect up sinks and sources? How do I make sure that my flow and my uh, pipeline infrastructure is, is appropriate? How do I make sure I build 
capacity which may be more than adequate for the current situation, but which then will start to be filled up in the future so that I don't have to constantly build new capacity in parallel with existing capacity. These are some of the national considerations. We need, of course, to understand economics. So we need to understand capture cost. Capture cost is probably the best understood element because that is a classical process engineering problem. It's nothing more than a gas separation problem. Uh, pipeline transportation is something, again, where we have reasonable understanding and we know that there are nonlinearities and economies of scale in pipeline transportation as in this diagram here. Storage cost is not so well understood because we haven't done large scale CO2 storage in Europe uh, to, a, to a great extent, but we do know a lot of uh, information from hydrocarbon uh, extraction in terms of platforms, drilling uh, and uh, well construction costs. So we can, we can start to build cost models. One of the interesting things around the cost of CCUS infrastructure is not the physical cost of buying and installing a pipe, but it's to do with the planning and regulatory processes for things like pipeline infrastructure. And so one of the interesting questions in systems engineering is if you can follow already existing pipeline corridors, which have been through planning and safety regulations, for example, for natural gas, will that save money compared to building uh, CO2 infrastructure in a completely different uh, direction. So if you put parallel infrastructure or reuse natural gas infrastructure, there should be a saving. So one of the things is to estimate the savings which may be made from following the infrastructure for natural gas. So this is the UK. It's showing some sources which are in green. So these are big CO2 emission sites. We have sinks here, we're just showing the southern sinks. So there's one in the Irish Sea over here and a number of sinks in the North Sea on the eastern side. And now what we want to look at is how might some CCS infrastructure evolve over time? And so what we see is if we have a national target, which is growing in terms of its need to sequester CO2 over time, we first start with some of the big CO2 sources, which are on this northeastern part of the UK or of England, where we have these relatively large <clears throat> sources. We connect them up into a central pipeline infrastructure, which goes offshore into these North Sea sinks. That is the most cost effective way to start the UK system. Then, as the target increases to 54 million tons per year, we not only expand this infrastructure. So the first thing we did was in the systems engineering perspective, we made sure that this common infrastructure here is already large enough to account for the increased capacity from these southern sites. So you don't design a system for steady state. You design it as an evolutionary system when you're looking at CCUS. And therefore, you anticipate the future capacity requirements. And here we can see we're now opening up new CO2 stores. We're also now starting to take advantage of the storage on the western side of the UK. And now we continue to increase the uh, number of uh, sources of CO2 which are added to the infrastructure. We're adding new links. The model has decided it is worth following the natural gas infrastructure because the planning considerations will be less onerous. And then finally, we reach a, a, a very high level of CO2 capture where we are now uh, developing quite a lot of new pipeline infrastructure. One of the questions we're now looking at for these sites in southern Wales, whether we might actually ship this CO2 from this location to this field over here rather than move it by pipeline. It's probably going to be cheaper to ship. So that's the national level considerations. Now let's talk about the regional level considerations. And I think the regional level are best understood in the context of industrial clusters, which of course is often where chemical uh, processing systems also become interesting. So the first thing to note is that when we have industrial clusters, these are one of the first places where we should be looking at CO2 capture because 
the cost of capture from some of the industrial processes is relatively low. So for example, you can see here natural gas processing, so sweetening of natural gas, hydrogen production, ammonia production, ethanol fermentation, ethylene oxide production. The cost of capturing CO2 from these industrial processes is less than uh, $40 per tonne. So these are some good opportunities to explore capturing CO2 at relatively high concentrations at relatively low cost. Then of course the question is, you know, do we store that underground or do we use it in another process? So at the scale of regional clusters, we can see some examples here of industrial clusters which have a lot of concentrated CO2 sources. So this first one is the uh, Humberside region of the UK which has a lot of power generation and chemical and steel types of processes. This region here is the Rotterdam area, which again has a lot of uh, power plants, refineries, petrochemicals and, and other processes. And this region here is the Grangemouth uh, region of Scotland, which has refining and petrochemicals. So each of these is showing a kind of a design of a CCUS system, which is capturing CO2 from a number of point sources, distributing it and then storing it offshore, reusing it. These three designs also include hydrogen generation and capturing the CO2 from blue hydrogen production and reuse of the hydrogen in these processes. One of the challenges, of course, in, in industrial process clusters is we have a lot of point sources of, of CO2. So we have high purity and high quantity CO2, but then a, a long tail of relatively low purity and re relatively low concentration of, of CO2. So some of the questions there are, you know, do we capture all of that CO2 or do we try to find ways of stopping some of those emissions and maybe replacing them with electrification of hydrogen? So that's one of the things we need to consider at the system level. And what we found in, in one of our case studies is that instead of only looking at CCUS, but actually combining hydrogen as either industrial feedstock or as an energy feedstock, what we find in this top picture is that if we only apply CCS and we try to do decarbonization, so the x-axis is the degree of CO2 emissions reduction, and this is the cost of the emissions reduction. If we only go CCS, which is the solid line, we reach a limit of how much CO2 we can capture. Whereas if we use CCS and hydrogen, first of all, we can go beyond the limit and actually go to negative emissions. And secondly, the cost of the avoided emissions is lower. So deeper and cheaper with hydrogen and CCS. And here we can see that if we look at CO2 price as the driver, increasing the CO2 price initially has no effect on the uh, CO2 intensity, it just stays this green, it just stays the same. Then we hit a trigger price and we start to make some investments in CCUS. And eventually, as we increase the cost of CO2, the investments drive the CO2 intensity actually to negative. Then, for a few minutes, my final level is what we call the process system level, which is thinking, yeah, particularly in the context of this webinar, how can we use CO2? And again, there are some really interesting systems questions of what's the best thing to do with captured CO2 if we're going to try to convert it into something. Now, of course, this is a, a new uh, thing at the moment, but actually we've been using CO2 in, in other processes for a long time, for example, urea production. So the first thing we need to think about, and we need to think very carefully in, in, in CO2 utilization is what are the key performance indicators in terms of what we're trying to achieve? So for example, how long will we lock the CO2 up? Uh, how efficiently will we absorb the CO2? What's the proportion of CO2 in the product? What are the other abatement effects? For example, are we displacing another material which has a high CO2 intensity? And then how much energy do we need to make the product? So you can see here, this is a study that was done by the UK government which shows that, for example, synthetic methane or synthetic methanol comes with a lot of red flags, but it does displace a fossil fuel. Polymers could be a good opportunity. Carbonation of minerals could be a good opportunity, maybe cement. So there are some 
some important uh, KPIs to be considered. Big systems questions are, you know, what is the best thing to do with renewable electricity, for example? Do we focus on energy products? Do we focus on polymers? How scalable is the technology? What is the risk associated with it? So we'll hear some more about this later on. Here's one example. So it's the simplest example I can think of, uh, just to give you an idea of how we might do benchmarking. So formic acid is one of the simplest things you can make with CO2 utilization, it has 100% uh, atom economy. There's a nice process patented by BSF, which gives a very high yield. And so uh, we did some process design of this just to develop some KPIs. So these are some of the KPIs we're trying to think of. So one is if you take your product, it is actually 90% CO2. So it's a nice product in the sense that the bulk of the mass is the CO2. How much energy do we need in terms of heat and power? Uh, and how much can energy integration reduce that? What are the GHG uh, emissions if you have uh, natural gas providing the heat, or can you have some other way of providing the heat for the process? And here you can find, for example, that the economics of the product are actually competitive, but if it's an energy store, then it's a very expensive way to store energy. So formic acid, you would think of it as being a chemical feedstock. One of the ways I find very useful to look at this is something that was developed by one of our speakers today, Andre Bardo, which is a, uh, a way of thinking about if you have surplus power as the driver for CO2 utilization, how do you make sure that you are using the right process? And this is a life cycle method, which for me, life cycle analysis is one of the key tools of systems engineering. So I, I recommend this methodology for, for CO2 utilization. So in summary, systems considerations. Well, first of all, you need to think from the national to the regional to the process level. Clearly, we need to optimize the processes to minimize energy consumption and to maximize the take up of CO2. We need to make sure our processes are scalable. We need to make sure that the energy balance and the life cycle analysis are telling us we won't have unintended consequences. But most importantly, we need to go back to those questions. CCUS, what are we actually trying to achieve? Is it decarbonization? Is it energy security? Is it substituting fossil fuels? And um, is it supporting renewables penetration? Is it storing surplus power? So if we know the answer to those questions, we can then have the confidence to design an appropriate system. So. Thanks for your attention and happy to answer any questions now or later on as well. Hi Nile, thanks very much for your uh, presentation. In fact, we, we, we have uh, two, I think, uh, quick questions. The first one is, uh, how do you see the potential for BE CCS? Uh, so for instance, in the UK especially, so for instance, uh, it is mentioned a, a drugs power plant using uh, some million tons of wood per year, uh, and there is a potential for negative uh, emission utilization there. So what's uh, your opinion? Yes, on that? I think that's, I think that's a, a very good point. I think the UK has set a net zero target by 2050. To reach net zero by 2050, we will need to have somewhere between 50 to 130 million tons of negative emissions. And, you know, in terms of cost effectiveness, BECSS is going to be likely to be cheaper than direct air capture. So the importance then is to make sure from a full life cycle analysis, what is the actual life cycle negative emissions per gigawatt hour of electricity. So it's, it's very important then to, to do the carbon accounting carefully and make sure that you're not creating a problem when you're trying to create a solution. So as long as you are sure over the whole life cycle, the emissions are indeed negative and in a large quantity, then that is a good uh, thing to explore. And then uh, I will pick up another general question, which is uh, uh, what do you think it is, let's say the uncertainty error effect uh, when you carry out uh, whole systems analysis? I think the biggest uncertainty is exactly in, in the point I made, which is over the whole life cycle, because 
you have to first of all think about whether your life cycle analysis is what we call consequential or attributional um, is what are the overall environmental impacts especially once you start to think about environmental impacts beyond just uh, the global warming potential but also resource depletion for example when you are developing new processes to what extent are you requiring uh, more exotic materials more um, rare materials if you're going for example high pressure uh, PEM electrolyzers you know what what is the implications for platinum and iridium reserves if you're going to go for these things at scale so I would say that the full life cycle analysis and especially looking at the non GWP effects are still the areas where we are not 100% sure of what the implications will be but I think we know what some of the concerns around scarce materials land use water use are likely to be so those hotspots should always be analyzed Thanks a lot. Uh, there are other questions, but uh, we will try to deal with them at the end. So now we move to, to the next speaker. Thank you. Okay, then uh, it's my turn. Welcome, everyone. So uh, my name is Andrea Ramirez. I'm professor on low carbon systems and technologies at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. Let me just share my screen. Um, could you confirm you? I see my screen, please. Yes. All fine. Yes, yes fine. perfect. Um, so uh, I'm also a chemical engineer, and I also do system analysis. So I think I'm, uh, Nilay and I, uh, our talks actually uh, overlap a bit, but actually complement. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Um, so one of the first things that people tend to um, ask you is, you know, is CCU a good idea? And I always say, well what are you specifically speaking about? Because ECU is an umbrella concept. It's, it's almost like then are chemicals a good idea? Well, which chemical are you speaking about? So CCU embeds all kinds of chemicals, all kinds of processes, all kinds of products. So you cannot just say this is good or this is bad and just put all that into one box. So that is the first uh, thing that makes the story very complicated and somehow makes the story more simple when you speak about CCS just because you are speaking about the long-term storage of CO2 um, out of the atmosphere and there is no that product and kind of product that you may have. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide because uh, uh, Nilay had a very similar one just to say there are different reasons to um, pursue CO2 utilization as uh, Nilay say what are you pursuing actually least how you are developing or designing your system and this is something that people generally takes as a given and has a little bit of a problem because through the analysis it changed from climate change and then do the techno-economic analysis in another framework and then suddenly come circularity in developing the scenarios and it's not clear exactly what services your um, product providing so that will be my first um, also recommendation, you need to have this very, very explicit. Now, the CCU uh, has gained increasing relevance through uh, the years um, that we know that the seminar is actually attracting quite a bit of attention. But if you look at the number of peer review publications, you also have seen an increase, especially, and I'm gonna change this to laser, um, since 2010, 2012. So yes, we have been looking at uh, CCO, at the use of CO2 for much longer than that, but you have seen the increase in publications, graphs, and funding on uh, CCO options. What we also see is uh, a framing of CCO in the area of contribution to climate change, and you see a a really a lot of mixed messages in literature going from very very important to no important and all in the middle and this is very confusing very confusing for companies very confusing for policymakers with what are we aiming at actually quality what is the potential and if you really take a look at the studies and try to understand why is the big range and we are speaking of worldwide some students saying it's only going to contribute to um, 0.5% and they are taking hands or recovery out of that uh, number to others saying 
10 or even higher, and do, they do have enhanced soil recovery there, um, you see that they are sometimes including a different basket of products on how they assess the potential. They are having different system boundaries. They are counting or not indirect effects. They have different rates of deployment in these scenarios. They are displacing or um, different amount of products, or they are having different kind of uh, scenario assumptions regarding availability of cheap electricity or hydrogen, and sometimes they are also speaking at different timelines, short term, medium term, long term. And when you just show those results and you don't harmonize with product, with system boundary, with effect, well, not surprisingly, you get this kind of ranges, and the picture is then rather muddy. Now, um, what, how I, uh, uh, or we personally look at um, CCU is in contribution on climate change, we need to differentiate between two different kinds of contributions. Then is, one is the direct one, is what we call, you know, is when the CO2 is inherently sequestered in the product and will not be released to the atmosphere. So when I count my contribution, CCU takes credit for the CO2 that is embedded in the product menos the CO2 that I emitted in the CCU chain to produce that product. Now, that's quite different from having an indirect contribution. And the indirect contribution is, yes, my CO2 is going back to the atmosphere, but it has replaced what I hope is a fossil-based product. And I say I hope because that is a big assumption. Now, in that case, the CCU takes credit for the CO2 that is not emitted, you're assuming it comes from a fossil fuel change, minus the CO2 that was emitted in the utilization chain. There will be some CO2 uh, utilization products that actually have both. Most of them have only indirect, and this is what people are calling, you know, displacement. You are assuming that you are displacing something, and I take credit for that uh, displacement. In fact, I emit in steel. And that's what people for it, you're still emitting. You're still adding CO2, but it's less CO2 that you will have emitted otherwise. Indirect, you are not adding CO2 because the CO2 is actually permanent uh, in the product. Now, for indirect credits, and that's where comes a large discussion, the reference system is actually what will play a key role. What am I displaced? And these people tend to see only in a life cycle perspective. I would argue it's also in your cost. So if you have a resident system and you have decided that your CO2-based methanol is a fuel, so that have actually have the function of the system as a fuel. Most studies, both techno-economic to look at, is this, you know, having a business case in the near future or in the future versus the life cycle assessment, they tend to have the reference to days gasoline, for instance. And then I look at the delta and I can decide, do I have a business case or no? Do I have a good footprint or not? I, however, could argue that if it's in the future, you may be displacing biofuel. You may be displacing hydrogen-based transport. You may displace electric vehicles. And then the delta falls for your base case, for your economic and your environmental performance is different. So it's a different um, business case if you are gonna displace this and a different LCA that if you are gonna displace this. And because we are looking into the future, and we, we do not have the magic ball that tells us it's going to displace A, B, C. And these are complex markets where it's difficult to actually guide directly the displacement. Now, our suggestion at this moment is to feel and, and to do more than one scenario, to design the systems and really analyze them. What happens if I'm not displacing gas oil, but I'm displacing, for instance, electric vehicles on hydrogen? Does it make sense? How do I guarantee? Well, how can I actually push the system in one direction or another? Now, if you change your reference system and if your CO2-based methanol is now a power to X to power option, so I'm going to store the methanol and when I need electricity, I can produce again, then it's an energy storage for intermittent renewables. And the reference with gasoline is absolutely uh, not a good one because gasoline is not an energy storage for intermittent renewables, neither is biofuel. So if you are using uh, a power to X to power, then your reference system will have to be what will be the most likely, you know, storage technology um, 
if I will not have the, the methanol. And then it could be hydrogen, it could be, you know, the battery in electric vehicle or, or outside battery. And again, your business case, your function and your life cycle assessment change. What I have seen in some uh, studies is actually the storage function is here, but the reference scenario has actually another function. And that comparison then doesn't produce good insights. Now, it was named before, CCO wants to deliver negativity, and we published um, a study about this, uh, I think a year ago, on what is actually a negativity, when are negative emissions, negative emissions. And we came with very four very simple, straightforward, almost energy mass and balance kind of principles, which I think are at the core of negativity. And the one is that it has to be a physical removal of uh, CO2 from the atmosphere. It cannot be displacement. It's not about avoidance. It's not about the emissions that I would have not emit. Those are important, but that's not for negativity. The negativity is really I'm taking CO2 physically out of the atmosphere and I remove it in a manner intended to be permanent. The upstream and the downstream greenhouse emissions are estimated and included in the emission balance. So large system boundaries, cradle to grave. And of course, as in any balance, what I remove has to be larger than what I'm putting in. It looks very, very straightforward, but all of us we are actually quite surprised when we see some studies claiming negativity when actually there is no permanence or the system boundaries are very short. So many CCO technologies, for instance, if they don't have permanent removal, cannot fulfill these four conditions. It doesn't mean that they cannot be beneficial and they will not be needed for climate change, but because, for instance, they can provide displacement or large CO2 avoidance, but they cannot claim new activity. And I think that's, that's a very important point. What you see for negativity then um, is that the storage time plays a key role in determining direct contributions. And I think there is no debate when we say it's quite straightforward to know that products with short storage time. So products like urea where the CO2 will go back into the atmosphere after it's applied in the agricultural soil in a week or so, you know, uh, soil has taken the nitrogen and the CO2 is out or fuels there is not really direct contribution. There is no large term storage. If there is a displacement, but there is no direct contribution. It's also relatively straightforward, a little bit less straightforward than with the short storage time. If you go to the other stream and then you look at CO2 mineralization. Depending on the kind of mineralization, the on the conditions, um, if you can guarantee that it's really gonna be in the product, then you can claim both direct and indirect contributions. And what right now the debate is, what do we do with the whole portion in the middle? And it's mostly intermediate chemicals and materials. How long is long enough? how feasible and likely. And every time I have this debate, people began to speak about plastics and the fact that we are gonna have a circular economy and the plastics are gonna go around and around and around. But I would say, we need to really guarantee and it has to be monitored and it has to be accounted for. So it's, it's not a, a wish system. Then how do we guarantee that we are gonna have actually uh, plastic going around so the CO2 doesn't go back to the atmosphere. And we also have to take into account the processes, you know, from an energetic point of view, are not 100% efficient. So you will require extra energy, you will require extra CO2. And if you don't guarantee that those are actually renewable or, you know, then your negativity is going to go decrease with every cycle. So how do you manage that? And it's not as simple as just assuming that it's going to happen. We need to design those systems. Now, the other aspect that you have with CCO change is there are multi-stakeholder chains. That means there is gonna be somebody producing the CO2, there is somebody producing the capture, maybe a second party will be transported, generally another party will be producing the utilization product. The user is a different stakeholder. Let's assume that you are gonna have negative emissions, so let's assume you have a huge displacement effect. In the system level, at the larger boundaries, you have a net amount of uh, displacement or negativity. But the stakeholders, and that's part of how people do business, they want to know what is my share there. And then you need to have an allocation of emission and cost along the chain. And how do we allocate? Well, we allocate you know, the capture unit, for instance, to the power plant, and the methanol production is only charge of this part and they 
this one will take share of the CO2 emissions or whether we actually uh, say no, the capture unit is going to be part of my utilization or I'm going to share it. How you do that will actually influence how you allocate emissions and then it's going to influence how people develop or not business cases. Now, uh, we design new technologies with a system in mind, and I think that was one of the first slides uh, that I've show. What happened is most of the time it's not made explicit. So here is a system, coincidentally, for Micasid, uh, where you can produce it and have, you know, a short and a medium and a long-term future. From a system point of view, but from a simple engineering point of view, what we are asking is that when you design technologies, you make this kind of questions. You ask, do I need to have energy? And where is that energy coming from? And what is the quality of the energy? Is continuous or is intermittent? At what cost? What about water? What about critical raw materials? Where is the CO2 source? How pure it is? What is the quality of the product? What is the size? Do I go for economies of number or do I go for economies of scale? What is the timeline I'm looking at? What infrastructure will be required? So that, that is how we will design. And what we see often with both techno-economic and life cycle assessments is that people are designing for non-realistic conditions or partial system boundaries. What do I mean? People are assuming a lot of free launches. They are thinking, you know, I'm gonna design my system, I'm gonna assume that the energy will be available, it will be at my door, it will be cheap. People, some people say, well, they are gonna even pay me to use that energy. It's gonna be continuous, it's gonna be low carbon zero. What about the CO2? It's also gonna be at my gate, it's going to be pure, it's going to be cheap or for free because it's a waste and it will have no carbon footprint. What about the downstream? Oh, no, 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 that's not, not complicated, but you forget that you are selling a product with some specs. Or the user phase, when people say, well, I don't need to take into account the user phase when I do a LCA because formic acid is formic acid. And I always say, well, it depends what you are using the formic acid. Today, the formic acid is an agricultural product. Is for agricultural purposes. So if you are using formic acid, your new CO2-based formic acid for that, from an LCA point of view, you may have a case. But if you are arguing that your formic acid is a storage technology or hydrogen carrier, that's a completely different end of life, and you can just not assume it's the same, and that will change the way you do your uh, life cycle assessment. This is work that my group has been doing on understanding how to design electrochemical conversion of CO2 when you have intermittent sources. So people um, tend to assume is this, uh, you know, you can assume it's a continuous life cycle, sorry, a continuous plant. This was a continuous ethylene. So CO2 to ethylene via electrochemical conversion. And we assume it was uh, 35,000 tons, a relatively small one. And then we say, well, what happens? How is the design changing? If we suddenly would like this to make flexible because we are going to have this load following plant. And we did different design strategies. And this one is one with actually we reduce the heat integration for increased the flexibility and we reduce the size of the plant. We are also in this plant, for instance, we were selling the oxygen and in this one we didn't because the oxygen storage was actually consuming too much uh, energy for the plant. My whole point on whether or not you agree with this design, and this was just one of, of many options that, that we are examining, is that when we took into account assisted conditions, only the plant layout, the capacity, the mass, the energy balance, it changed. And therefore, my CAPEX, my OPEX, and my life cycle assessment also changed. So whether or not you take this into account will change how you design and what kind of reactors and how do you put them together to get your product output. You will need electricity, and this is uh, from McKenzie, published not that much um, time ago, 2018. And if you look at cases where actually there is low electricity prices and people are using a lot of electricity, for instance, for hydrogen or for CCU, we're speaking about an electricity consumption that can be nine times actually generation um, of what we have today. And that is a large amount of infrastructure. And Something that I have heard a lot, and I think uh, is, uh, well, yes, and it will come, but this is part of the chicken and egg problem. You don't have a business, or you don't put a business, if you don't know, you can get the feedstock, and you can get your product away. 
but you don't put the infrastructure unless you know that business are gonna be there. So how is the infrastructure gonna be designed? How do you design to the future and who is gonna pay that? We know that we would like to use, for instance, current infrastructure, but if you look at people who are doing hydrogen, they are planning to use the gas pipelines. If you look at people doing CCS, they are planning to use the gas pipelines, the existing ones. The problem is that one of the two is gonna use it, the other has to create new infrastructure. So we will also need new infrastructure for uh, electricity. We will need to realize where are the location of the electrolyzers. So it's a very interlink, intersystem problem that make it very, very, very complex. And uh, I'm just gonna finalize. And I would like to say there is something that I think is at this moment under study is the hybrid strategy. So uh, uh, Nilay name one, produce hydrogen and produce CCS. We study a different one, which is um, a refinery, a real refinery. And we say, what is in the refinery? You do both. You capture as much CO2 as possible, and then you use part of the CO2 in this case to produce both polyols and DME, which are typical business in the refinery, and the rest of the CO2 you store. And we did different configurations in parallel and cascade. And what we found was actually that the cases which will provide the most economic or the most economic cases with the really good footprint were the cases where we combine both CCS and CCU. CCS giving you the large part of the climate benefits, CCU helping you with the business case. And I think this kind of strategy is going from competition between CCS and CCO to try to understand how can we have synergies will be much better. If you ask me uh, just rolls of a thumb, I will say, well, when you look at CCO and what to choose, you will choose six that, you know, market size, the bigger, the better, source of CO2, the purer, the better, CO2 storage time, the longer, the better. The source of energy and uh, the CO2 capture and the utilization as well of hydrogen are very dependent on where, how, whether they are low carbon, how cheap they are, and of course are the issues of displacement that we need to tackle. For the way forward, I think the, the competition between CCS and CCU will damage both and it will have big implications on climate change. I think we can find synergies among business cases for CCU on large scale climate bio CCS options for negative emissions. We need to recognize difference between sectors and between options. So there is much more than CO2 to fuels. I don't think there is a small problem with a small niche. Not every product has to solve the worldwide problem. Uh, but I think if we design processes and products that promote large scale capture that help to build the infrastructure, then the benefits go beyond the small niche. Therefore, we need also support for the common infrastructure work for CCS and CCU, and we need to look at the environmental performance of full systems. And that's it. So uh, if there is any questions, I will show, stop sharing my screen if I manage. I don't. Okay, no new questions, I think. Uh, so perhaps if uh, there are any questions, so we'll uh, take them at, uh, at the end of the webinar. Okay. Uh, so uh, thanks very much for, uh, for your contribution, Andrea. And uh, yeah, I think we can uh, uh, give the floor to the next speaker. Who is uh, Marco? Perhaps uh, I don't uh, remember. Uh, I don't know, Andre. Uh, uh, yeah, Marco. Okay, Marco, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Hello to everybody, and um, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for organizing such a stimulating and interesting webinar. I'm really happy to be part of it. Um, so I'm. Um, I'm Marco Mazzotti, I'm also a chemical and process engineer and I work at ETH Zurich. And I would like to talk about uh, um, the role that CCU and CCS can play to enable, to enable a net zero CO2 emissions uh, chemical industry. And I, I will build on what uh, uh, the previous speakers have already said. And I'm trying to 
let's say, distill um, a few take-home messages from, uh, from my talk, and I will uh, kind of spell them out one by one uh, during my talk. And the first is that counteracting climate change requires mitigating CO2 emissions on the one hand, but also creating negative emissions because of uh, unavoidable remaining emissions, for example, from the chemical industry, for example, from the aviation sector. And I will use these as examples. The second is that point source CO2 capture is feasible today. We know how to do it. We can do it across sectors and we can store CO2 safely uh, and this will be accessible Europe-wide wide, thanks to the um, uh, CO2 storage hubs that are being created. The third message has already been given. CO2 utilization is very energy intensive in most cases, and therefore we requ require clean energy to, to, to power these processes. And we need, as already said, a system level analysis to understand what impact the CCU has on the climate. My fourth message is that carbon dioxide removal from the atmosphere can be accomplished in, in two ways, via direct air capture or by exploiting biomass. And now I'm starting to go a little more into the details. And the first that I want to give is direct air capture is a technology that exists today. And there are a few companies offering it. I'm taking the one that works in Zurich, Climeworks. This is the plant that they installed um, in 2017. It captures 1.5, uh, so 1,500 tons of CO2 per year, and um, using a vacuum temperature swing absorption technology that is illustrated here. So basically, uh, CO2 is absorbed um, on, a, uh, on, a, on an absorbent um, so that the CO2 free air is released. And once uh, the box containing the absorbent is saturated, uh, it is regenerated using some type of uh, some power and some heat. And um, important to the technology that Climeworks, but also global thermostat in the US use, is that regeneration can be carried out at a relatively low temperature. In the case of Climeworks, CO2 is fed to a greenhouse, therefore CO2 is re-emitted afterwards. But of course, if the CO2 captured in this way were stored underground, we would achieve uh, a negative emission um, technology. Now, another way of removing CO2 from, from uh, the atmosphere is actually through biomass. And I would like to point um, uh, your attention to waste to energy plants. And I'm giving here, so the waste to energy plant is this one, and I'm giving a very kind of childish, childish example um, to highlight the fact that, that in the municipal waste that is treated in these plants, some of it, um, uh, for example, this plastic table contains fossil carbon. Some of it, for example, this wooden table, contains biogenic carbon that, um, that originally came from CO2 in the atmosphere. So if uh, uh, after burning this waste, um, the CO2 is captured in a conventional post-combustion capture process and then stored under, underground, and considering the fact that uh, in, in many cases, certainly in Switzerland, 50% of the waste contains biogenic carbon and 50% fossil carbon, well, we can achieve both mitigation of the emissions, so this black flux of uh, fossil carbon that is stored underground, but also, let's say, we, we generate negative emissions thanks to the biogenic fraction of the, uh, of the carbon in the waste. So um, we have to, to understand that CO2 emissions from European waste to energy plants are significant in terms of quantities. Um, and that waste to energy plants actually enable sustainable cities because they treat the waste, which is an important service, of course, they recycle precious materials, they generate heat and power that can be used, and they can contribute, if CO2 is captured, to mitigating emissions and generating uh, negative emissions. And uh, another important consideration is that biogas upgraders, which are very uh, which are present in, in, in many countries in Europe, um, actually provide biogenic CO2, which is even more accessible than the one coming from waste to energy plants. So we have ways to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. There are some, let's say, easy ones and less easy ones, but this is something we can do and we will be able to do it in the future. Now, having, let's say, created some background um, or summarized some background information for you, I would like now to um, to, um, uh, I see that there is a message here. I hope it's not, uh, yeah. So um, 
So I would like to focus on two examples. One is chemicals and the other one is jet fuels. Let me start with chemicals. And the, the key message here is that there are different options to make chemicals carbon neutral. So, and let me, let me discuss this um, with reference to a specific chemical, which is very important, which is methanol. And the reason is because uh, uh, by picking up a specific example, we can develop some numbers. So today, methanol is uh, um, produced from, um, mostly from, uh, from natural gas, so a fossil resource in a plant that delivers methanol. Methanol is used, this box represents uses of methanol. And at the end of the of, of service, let's say, um, uh, this uh, generates CO2 emissions to the atmosphere. Um, methanol can be, uh, let's say, uh, burned in a, in, a, in a distributed fashion or, the, or in a centralized plant where it's easy to capture the CO2, because that's what we have to do if we want to go to a net zero solution. We need to get hold of the CO2 that is emitted when methanol is used. And there are three ways of doing it. The first is, basically, we use this same scheme but when the CO2 is in the atmosphere, we can capture it using a direct air capture plant and store it underground. This requires some energy. We will evaluate it in a minute. It's a solution. It's a, it's a net zero CO2 solution. I'm simplifying the scheme. We know that life cycle analysis has to be done. It's complex. I'm trying to keep it simple because I think that the simple, simplified analysis can give important messages. So this is a solution that is based on CCS, so storage of CO2 with direct air capture. But there is an alternative, which is that of reusing the CO2. So basically, once CO2 is captured from the atmosphere, it's sent to a plant that converts it into uh, methanol. And, um, and that is then used again, CO2 is emitted, and the cycle continues. Now, the need of energy, of electricity, of clean electricity is very high because to make methanol from CO2, you need to produce a hydrogen and then react hydrogen with methanol. And the plant that does this is not the same that we have today. We need to build a new process technology and a new plant. This is a solution based on using CO2, so CCU, but again, direct air capture is needed to get the CO2 back from the atmosphere, like here. The third option is to go for biomethanol and using biomass. And I think the cycle is, is kind of obvious and we have, uh, a biorefinery, let's say, that delivers um, uh, green methanol, bio, biomethanol. Now, what are the energy requirements for these four approaches? And I show uh, these results from a paper that we have um, published recently with Matteo Gazzani and Paolo Gabrielli. Um, I split the energy requirements in power, purple, and heat, red, for the four cases. And of course, in the, the, the current business as usual case, these energy requirements are low because energy comes essentially with a fossil fuel. In the case of bio, these we have some requirements, but uh, lower than the other than in the other cases. And for CCS DAC and CCU DAC, we see that we have comparable heat requirements, but the power requirement is much higher in the case of uh, of uh, CCU. So we could choose which technology uh, suits uh, us best based on these energy requirements, but this would be uh, short-sighted because we need also to consider other aspects. And the one important aspect is the uh, availability of land that in the case of uh, CCU DAC needs to serve the, let's say, harvesting of uh, carbon-free renewable electricity and uh, the, uh, needs to be used to install the uh, direct air capture collectors. In the case of uh, CCS DAC, uh, what is needed is, of course, a storage site, but uh, the land use is uh, very small. But in the case of biomethane, that's where we have a problem, that uh, we need a lot of land, and uh, these numbers are, are correct, are precise, uh, how many square meters we need to produce one ton of methanol per year using, using um, uh, biomass. So, um, we, we have uh, different alternatives. I will summarize later what the pros and cons are, but I think we can see them in this slide. But let me give you some more details. In order to evaluate these energy consumptions, we have looked at uh, um, detailed schemes. For example, this is the CCS DAC uh, technology chain that includes um, methanol production, use uh, direct air capture and storage of CO2. And uh, uh, we have looked also at other schemes. And for all these schemes, we have been able to <clears throat> calculate not only the electricity and heat consumption, 
but also we have been able to split uh, this consumption for the different elements in the technology chain. Let me focus on one uh, um, uh, piece of information here, and I would like to look at the CCU DAC, the technology that was in the previous slide, where we see and pay attention to the scale because here there is a there is a gap between one and ten. So when uh, um, when it comes to electricity, in the case of CCS DAC, we are below one, and uh, uh, most of electricity is needed for data capture. In the case of uh, utilization of CO2, more or less the same amount of electricity is needed for uh, for data capture and for methanol production, uh, but the big chunk of it is needed to produce hydrogen by electrolysis. Mm -hmm. So this is we, we see where we can, let's say, uh, invest uh, resources in order to improve the technology and improve the energy the energy penalty. Certainly not in the synthesis of methanol, but in the generation of um, of, um, of clean hydrogen. Um, there is another consideration that is a consequence of what I've shown you here, which is, um, which is the following. So the, the, the diagram that you see here um, it give, gives the energy requirement for a solution for a technology chain that uh, delivers no emissions. So it's a net zero CO2 emissions solution. It's based on the assumption that all the energy comes into the system carbon free. Of course, this is a, a strong assumption, and um, uh, we need to consider the possibility that, uh, that uh, electricity, in particular, is not carbon free. And we do this in this diagram here. So this diagram, we have the carbon intensity of electricity on the horizontal axis. So it's zero in the calculations done here. And on the vertical axis, we have the CO2 emissions specific to the amount of methanol produced. And um, in this diagram, these emissions are zero. So basically what I've said until now corresponds to the origin in this diagram. But now, uh, if you take a business as usual solution, we know that we have emissions, and this is the level of emissions we have today. And now if we let the carbon intensity of electricity vary, increase, well, in the case of the current solution where we let CO2 go into the atmosphere, well, there is basically no variation because the electricity requirement is very, very small. But in the other cases, the emissions are going to increase essentially linearly with the carbon intensity of electricity. And what we see is that the, the, the biomass based solution and the solution based on CCS and DAC uh, managed to be better than the business as usual solution, basically for carbon intensity of electricity corresponding to the average of the European Union, which is about, about here, while the CCU solution uh, pays a high price because of the high uh, uh, electricity intensity of the process and it becomes actually causes more CO2 emissions for uh, the, uh, for the um, energy mix that the average European Union country has. And this is, has to be, of course, considered very carefully because basically this effect spoils the benefit of reusing CO2. Okay, let me come to my, um, well, my last example, which is jet fuels. Um, aviation is a, a sector which is very difficult to decarbonize, and uh, there are a lot of discussions how to do it. And of course, synthetic jet fuels are mentioned as one of the solutions. I want to show you in my uh, next few slides that um, they are the least cost effective option, actually, and they require high carbon tax in order to become interesting from an economical point of view. So basically, what I'm going to tell you about jet fuels from a technical point of view, is that uh, essentially we can look at the same chains that we've looked at for methanol. The only difference is that now, instead of producing methanol, we produce a jet fuel, and the box representing the use of the product becomes an aircraft that uh, emits uh, um, CO2 while it, while it flies and uses uh, jet fuels. So we can have conventional jet fuels as we do today. We can uh, use conventional jet fuels and uh, um, uh, remove the CO2 from the atmosphere as here, or we can uh, generate synthetic jet fuels as we do here with uh, using the CO2 capture from air, or we can make bio jet fuels. Now, in order to compare from an economical point of view these different solutions, we have uh, in, uh, in a paper that we have recently submitted, we have, uh, 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 let's say, penalized the, uh, the conventional solution by um, by uh, considering a carbon tax. These solutions are in principle net zero, 
this solution, what we do today, emits CO2, and we compensate for it by, um, by, um, by enforcing a carbon tax. Now, we have looked at technology chains. I'm not going to go into the details because um, this would take too much time. And that these technology chains are very similar to the ones for methanol with uh, some small differences accounting for the uh, specificities of, uh, um, of the chemical characteristics and the chemical processes related to jet fuels. Um, there is a paper submitted with Viola Beccatin and Paolo Gabrielli that um, will soon be published, hopefully. So when we look at these different chains, we, um, we, we come up with um, um, the data reported here in terms of jet fuel cost as of today. And these are the, the bars with, um, with, um, without the stripes, let's say, and the electricity input, which in the case of, uh, uh, of um, uh, technology that recycles CO2, so synthetic fuels, again, the cost is very high and uh, the electricity input is much higher than in the case where we actually um, implement CCS. This is something, it's not surprising because it's the same, basically the same situation as in the case of methanol. Um, and as a consequence, also in this case, when we consider the carbon intensity of electricity, we realize that synthetic fuels uh, lead to emissions of CO2 that are higher than the conventional technology we use today, even for countries with such a low um, uh, carbon intensity of the um, energy mix, like France and Switzerland. And, uh, um, and uh, even more dramatic the situation is in the case of the uh, average European Union carbon intensity. So this is basically the same that I showed you for methanol. It's uh, now recalculated and confirmed in the case of jet fuels. But uh, here we have done, uh, it, it, we have made a step forward by looking at uh, the jet fuel costs projected to 2050 for the different uh, um, solutions that we have um, uh, considered. And uh, uh, in, in, doing, in doing this projection, we have included the effects of the learning, learning curves associated to the different technologies, so how these improve in terms of efficiency and costs. We have considered uncertainty in the carbon tax. This is the red uh, case here where we have the business as usual solution uh, so with emissions of CO2 and carbon tax, whose cost increases, and it is in a very broad range because of the uncertainty about how the ta carbon tax will develop in the future. And we have also included the effect of uh, uncertainties in uh, the other important uh, parameters controlling the cost of these different technology chains. And we have done this uh, um, both with this uh, type of representation, but also by doing a Monte Carlo um, analysis, uh, Monte Carlo simulations, and I would like to comment on these uh, by looking at, uh, we have sampled um, a number of uh, properties of the systems, uh, learning rate, capital cost of the different uh, technology chains, uh, technology components, sorry, the levelized cost of electricity, the jet fuels cost and the carbon tax, and uh, we have varied them in a range between, between minus 20 and plus 20 percent, and uh, we have looked at how the costs, uh, which are on the horizontal axis, the jet fuel costs, are distributed, this is the vertical axis, um, in 2020, 2030, and so on until 2050. And what we see is that um, 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 today the business as usual, let's say the conventional fuels are here in terms of cost, uh, those uh, obtained by, uh, or net zero solutions obtained by using data capture and storage of CO2 to compensate for the emissions of aviation are here. And uh, the solution where we actually use CO2 to make synthetic fuels are down here. So with costs that are about three times more. And the same situation, when we compare direct air capture with CCS and direct air capture with CCU, we observe it going uh, along during the, uh, let's say during the century. The red distribution is the one that corresponds to um, this, the conventional fuels with emissions and carbon tax and the uncertainty is due to the fact that we, we don't know where the CO2 tax will be, the CO2 cost, the CO2 price will be fixed. I would like to, um, to skip this and I would like to show you uh, these final diagrams for my study of net zero jet fuels, um, where basically we have been able to consider the variability in the cost of electricity, which is on the vertical axis in all these cases, 
Let me focus on these two diagrams. And on the horizontal axis, we have the carbon price. So basically, we see that um, uh, the synthetic fuels uh, obtained by direct air capture and the utilization of CO2 um, are better in terms of cost than the conventional fuels to which the lead to emissions, but we, we enforce a carbon tax on them, when basically we are on the right hand side of the threshold that you see here, and the different thresholds correspond to different learning rates. Let's focus on one. Let's say this is the threshold for a given learning rate. If uh, the carbon tax is large enough or the cost of electricity is low enough, then uh, synthetic fuels will be better than um, conventional fuels uh, penalized by a carbon tax. And we see how big the effect of uh, the cost of electricity is in the case of direct air capture and CCU. And consider that the current cost of electricity is here. And the prediction scenarios indicate that it might go down in this region, but it's very unlikely that it will go below uh, the thresholds you see here. While, of course, direct air capture with CCS being less electricity intensive, intensive will be less affected by the cost of electricity. And these thresholds are essentially vertical. But I think that these uh, diagrams are a useful tool to uh, think in terms of how one can design policies, um, carbon pricing policies, and how one can, in, let's say, account for the effect of variation in the um, cost of electricity. So to summarize uh, how we can make net zero CO2 emissions, chemicals, or jet fuels, we have essentially three ways, and they have um, different pros and cons. Uh, and uh, the critical aspect, the critical element for the three is, in the case of bio, let's say, chemicals or fuels based on biomass, land use is the, is the critical element. In the case of uh, reusing CO2, so CO2 utilization, energy, carbon-free energy is the key factor. And in the case of uh, uh, direct air capture with CCS, CO2 storage is the critical element. So in principle, it's good. We have three options. They might be needed in different contexts, that they might be better in different contexts. But we have to keep in mind one thing. If we focus on the uh, CCS DAC solution, let's say the technology, the plants, the chemical plants that we need here and here are exactly the same. So we don't need to rebuild the chemical industry to implement this solution here. And the second consideration, if we look just at this element of this technology chain, so the capture of CO2 from air and the storage, well, this realizes negative emissions, so-called ducts. So this is something we will need in the future anyways, okay? So we need to keep in mind the differences, pros and cons, and these aspects that I mentioned. I know that I'm running out of time, so I'm just giving you the final take-home message. It's very similar to what Andrea Ramirez said. There is a pressing need for a European-wide CO2 network that serves all CO2 sources and all CO2 sinks. And I think we need really to push in, in this direction because it's essential to have a perspective of, of, of such a network in order to make it possible for those who want to reduce, avoid their emissions, um, to, make the, to make it possible for them to act, to take action. So thank you very much for your attention. And if there are questions, I'm happy to take them. Thanks very much, Marco. Uh, yes, we have some questions. I uh, selected, selected two. One uh, is uh, a rather generic one. Uh, uh, and the question is, uh, uh, have you thought about the possibility to use exergy instead of energy to, to compare uh, different, uh, different options? Yes, actually we do it whenever we need to uh, whenever we need to evaluate processes uh, where there is a, a, in, an electricity requirement and the heat requirement, we indeed use uh, exergy. In this case, uh, we have found it useful to keep the two separate so that we can uh, appreciate uh, the importance of uh, having clean electricity to make certain solutions possible. And the second one is about the jet fuel uh, case. Uh, so the question is, uh, uh, have you looked uh, also at the possibility of bio jet fuel, uh, fuels uh, with uh, the, the idea of capturing uh, bioorganic CO2 that is produced during the process? Um, 
Yes, no, not in detail, but there is a lot of literature. Actually, if you, um, the, the, the dashed line that you see here, it's a reference for the, for the current cost of, um, of biojet fuels. So it's certainly a very, a very interesting and important option. Um, we have just not uh, uh, studied it in detail for, um, because we want you to focus uh, to the other two alternatives. But it's very important, and uh, um, of course, with with um, with biojet fuels, you will have again uh, the problem of uh, of the land use. But if this is not an issue in a certain geographical context, uh, this is certainly a very important, very important option. I have to say that uh, we are seeing also emerging the possibility of using hydrogen as a fuel for for aircraft. So that is a very ambitious and I think um, uh, interesting program of, um, of Airbus in that direction. And uh, uh, there are many challenges, but I believe that this is uh, certainly something that has to be explored. And uh, we have not included that uh, um, possibility in, uh, in this work. Thanks a lot. Uh, there are other questions, but uh, they may be taken uh, during the, the, the final discussion. So I'd move uh, to the last uh, speaker. So, Andre, please, the, the, the room is yours. Thank you, Fabrizio. Um, I hope you can hear me now. And uh, thank you for organizing this session, uh, for inviting me, and uh, thank all the previous speakers for um, the interesting contributions. Um, I hope I can, uh, I will, uh, add at least some new elements um, uh, in this talk, um, which I called, uh, where are we actually going net zero or 100% renewables? And I will be touching some environmental trade-offs looking into a future chemical industry. So in order to stand uh, a reference point, um, we have to look at the current chemical industry. Uh, uh, first of all, I should point out that uh, this work has actually not been done by me, but by these smart people. Uh, students in the group, um, uh, Raul, Arne, Marvin, Benedict, Christian, Hessam, and my colleague Sang Won Su. So I, I don't want to uh, take these claims um, that I did all the work, they did the work. Looking at how can we transform the chemical industry. And I think what has been touched upon is that the chemical industry is a special industry because uh, we do really fossil, like many industries, but we need them for both energy and as a feedstock. And this is where a special challenge comes about. And what the chemical industry is using today, we know we emit these emissions and usually the emissions attached to the chemical industry are cited in the gigaton scale. But this is not the full life cycle picture. This is usually just direct emissions. And what's important is that we really look at the full life cycle, what is happening to our chemicals and what is actually our chem chemical industry contributing. And, um, uh, and uh, then, then we see the challenge. Um, that we have to, uh, um, and the question is, what is the challenge in the sense that Neelay put it out? And some people say the main challenge is uh, removing climate change, um, climate change mitigation, as we have been discussing. But for other people, it's, uh, it's the issue of uh, the fossil resources that we are using, and we should get rid of the fossil resources. And I think it's very important, as Neelay has been pointing out, that we clarify which question, which, which of what is your problem? And there's other, other things that have been highlighted. But um, changing the question means that you will also change the solution that you generate. And it's very important um, to define this. What is attractive about CO2 utilization for many people is that it kind of um, gives hope to address both problems at the same time. And that also kind of, kind of sneak into your analysis that you um, do not define the problem which you are actually solving. So many people are, are proposing uh, to do CO2 utilization, CO2 recycling. That is, we get rid of the fossil and we get rid of the emissions by um, having the CO2 running in the loop. Now, this sounds like a great idea, um, as long as you don't know much about thermodynamics. And this is where the challenge of CO2 utilization comes about. That's if you know about um, thermodynamics, you know that uh, CO2 is a very um, energy, um, poor molecule and the second law says uh, you can only go downhill and if you look at co2 you, um, there's not much downhill down here what is downhill and i wanted to emphasize this there are minerals down here 
So there are, and minerals are actually could be of interest. Um, so, um, so we could uh, do CO2 mineralization um, combining uh, magnesium or calcium um, oxides um, with CO2. And that's actually an exothermic reaction where we produce carbonates and silica oxides. And um, just to highlight the, these opportunities, that is um, thermodynamically favorable uh, CO2 utilization, and uh, it could be very, a very interesting area to explore. So uh, just to highlight this idea briefly, so what you could do really in this process, um, you could really perform the whole CCUS that has been highlighted. So you could capture CO2, for example, at a cement plant, ship it to a CO2 mineralization plant where we do the reaction I showed on your last slide. You produce the carbonates, which you could, in this example, you would store. These are thermodynamically stable molecules. So, so this would be a safe, permanent storage in, this, um, in a solid form. And then interestingly, the co-product silica oxides have, to be sh have been shown to have uh, porcelanic properties that allowed them to be um, blended with cement. So you could utilize this co-product to blend the cement, to create blended cement and replace some of the vir um, virgin material by, um, by the CO2 utilization byproduct. And that is an attractive process because CO2 uh, uh, conventional cement is very highly um, energy intensive and therefore also has a high carbon footprint. And by doing the CCUS process, what you could do is you would replace some, in this example, we assume 20% of the cement by, um, by the silica oxides. So I don't have to produce this virgin material. I do have the storage effect from producing the uh, magnesium carbonates and uh, this has to be traded off against the um, energy that is needed for the CO2 mineralization because the truth is that um, due to the slow kinetics, um, we do need actually uh, energy to drive this process. But overall, you see a substantial reduction in the carbon footprint of these blended cements created by CCUS. And what is interesting about um, this, uh, this reduction in carbon footprint is that actually this, this holds for today's carbon um, intensity of our energy supply. So I, I wanted to highlight that CO2 utilization um, can achieve in, in the mineralization context la very large specific CO2 savings even today. There's large markets, but we need to develop these markets. Um, and, uh, and that's, I think, an issue um, people are working on. And I think it ca um, got a lot of attention and more attention in the last years, and I'm happy to see this. Uh, to employ CO2 mineralization for storage and for uh, utilization. Okay, so this is the one element of the thermodynamics of CO2 conversion. There's another um, area where CO2 utilization will help us, and that is uh, what Mila has been highlighting as the new chemistries. Okay, so as I said before, usually we want to go up in thermodynamic um, energy content, and that is we need the energy, as I think all previous speakers have been pointing out. But in some cases, actually, we do have old chemistries where are, where are in particular reactants employed, and we do have too much energy already, because it's poorer chemistry in a sense. We are excessively exothermic, we waste energy, and we can employ CO2 to lead to new chemical routes that produce chemicals in a more efficient way. And there are these opportunities available. One example has been highlighted, that has been formic acid. I'd want to highlight another example where we can save this energy. And this is um, CO2-based polymers. So what you could do, you could capture CO2 and produce polymers. And that has been, um, uh, there's a prominent example uh, marketed by Covestro where they do poly polyurethane foams. And maybe you have heard this example before. That's, that's why I want to show a, a different example because what you can also now start doing with these new materials, you can produce CO2-based elastomers, that is rubber materials, where we had conventional processes that were um, very energy, energy intensive. And by using this new chemistry, we can reach a prop, a products that have very similar properties. And this is also beneficial as shown here. So what I show here is on the right-hand side, you see the novel CO2-based, um, uh, rubber materials convert uh, compared to conventional rubber materials. And here we uh, plotted four 
uh, target materials for the properties to be um, for the new um, uh, that we want to match with the new rubbers. And what you can see is that yes, indeed, the new CO2 based um, material reduces the carbon footprint compared to these um, materials uh, sig significantly. But what you also see is that this is not zero, actually it's still pretty far from zero. So um, uh, there is an opportunity to leading to more efficient chemistry, to more efficient processes. And I, I want to advertise that we should exploit this because uh, I think what we've seen in the previous example that the energy is gonna be um, an issue and efficiency is gonna stay important. And that CO2 utilization can play a role and we should not forget at this role. Actually, so uh, the carbon footprint looks nice. It looks more complex. If you look at other impacts, I want to highlight this, but maybe uh, to get some inspiration, the effect can be enormous. Um, that CO2 utilization has in a clever way. If you do the mass for this example, here using one kilogram of CO2 can avoid up to 12, as feedstock can up, avoid up to 12 kilograms of emissions. So, so, that's, uh, so there are great opportunities. But uh, these great opportunities are usually small in size. And that has been discussed before. So if we, the, the chemicals and um, the use cases that are large in the chemical industries are actually those that, that usually combine CO2 with uh, water and then, uh, then a lot, a lot, a lot of energy to go up um, the scale to the chemicals we know. And um, I think, uh, and the main energy driver is really then to convert the water into hydrogen usually. And I wrote it down in this way because to make it very transparent, what we are trying to do here is really to invert combustion. And, um, and that's important because it's a fundamental challenge. Um, and that's why I also put it in a thermodynamic context. Yes, we can improve the whole chain. We can close, get closer to the thermodynamic limit. But once we go for this route, it's intrinsic that this will be very in energy intensive. So there's no way to getting it around because what you're trying to do is you're trying to invert combustion for the whole chemical industry. So how does this play out for the chemical industry? Is this a route and what are the trade-offs? And that's what I want to discuss in the final part of the presentation. So what we looked at is um, the chemical industry. And for the purpose of this talk, I mainly focus on results saying, okay, I want to look at where the carbon is going because that's the in, um, issue. And most of the carbon in the chemical industry ends up in plastics, actually in polymers. So usually we have this chemical industry that is based on fossil resources. And um, the idea is now uh, what we've seen, we, should, we need to change this to mitigate climate change. And, um, and we want to explore the options for this. And uh, what we looked in particular, we looked at 14 different large scale polymers and at their production chain to analyze how could we um, convert um, polymers production um, for climate change mitigation. So uh, with this, we cover about 90% of the polymers uh, that are product produced globally. And what did we do? We developed a model of the supply chain of the chemical industry, because what you've seen in the last slide in the picture is the trick is that these things are usually interconnected. It's usually not good enough, as, as Andrea has been pointing out, you really not, uh, need to connect the, the different dots and elements to add up with the whole full picture. And you cannot just jump in and say, I change one little thing and then the whole, um, uh, without uh, analyzing the system's impacts. So that's why we con constructed a model of this, uh, the chemical and plastics industry. So what we did do, we built a database where we included the fossil technologies and then we pick the best available fossil technologies in, in terms of CO2 impact. And we looked at uh, technologies to produce um, a C um, in a circular fashion uh, chemi um, the chemicals. So in total we have about 400 data sets in our database uh, from the processes. What we extract for our models are basically just the mass and energy balances. And we look at what, how much in particular in this, what I will show to you, what are the flows we send to the environment and what are the resources we are taking out, in particular CO2. So with this database and with this model, we can perform a life cycle assessment of the whole um, chemical or here plastics industry. So what we did is we built a model where we connect all these uh, different elements 
And we ask them, and for the person of this presentation, I will take it to the extreme. I say, well, very clearly state my objective function because my objective function is to minimize the global warming impact from cradle to grave. So we look at the full life cycle to produce these plastics. And we look at projections for 2050. So in LCA terms, that's our functional unit. And I will vary the carbon footprint um, uh, in, in different examples to, to highlight uh, this important element. Okay, so as a reference point, we can look at how are we producing the plastics today. So here you see the fossil-based uh, chemical industry, and this looks like um, a little like the sketch I shown you before. So it's really the fossil re uh, resources coming in, mainly oil in particular, that we split into our basic chemicals for monomers and that then end up into our polymers. So we did, we kept the technology mix fixed, so the technologies that you could uh, employ and, and use them projections for market demands into the future in 2050. And uh, what you end up is uh, with estimates that this, uh, just scaling up the plastics industry, the market to 2050, could lead up to five gigatons emissions per year. So this is really a significant value and uh, there's a lot of studies out there that say, if we don't change the chemical industry, it will become the main driver for global oil demand in the future. So, so it's really uh, urgent. We will not reach um, carbon neutrality without addressing the chemical industry. So what are the options to decarbonize the chemical industry? And one option, um, and, and this plastics production, is going to CO2 and uh, water electrolyzers, as I've been highlighted before. But uh, as Andrea rightly pointed out, I think even in the, within the context of this session, we should not get blinded by saying, okay, it has to be either CO2 utilization um, or CO2 storage, because there's really more options on the table and we need to look at all of them in a consistent way. So what we looked at also is polymer waste recycling. That is uh, both mechanical and chemical recycling technologies. And we looked at employing biomass. So this is about looking at carbon looping technologies. I will start by looking, um, showing results uh, for how does the world look like for using CO2 and water, and then I will compare it to the other technologies. So here you see results, and that's uh, taken for 2030, for the footprint, the cradle to gave footprint for um, chemicals. If we, if we minimize the CO2 emissions, and these are cradle to grave emissions, and, as my, uh, and what, what I varied, I varied the amount of electricity that is available for CO2 utilization. And this graph is rich in information, but what do, what, what do you see? Now, first of all, what you see is you can end up almost being almost carbon neutral in the end. What do you need for this? This is plotted here. This is you need, this is a carbon footprint of the electricity I'm employing. So what you see is you need clean electricity. If it's not beyond a threshold, nothing will happen. Actually, the fossil is the least emitting um, CO2 pathway. And only if I have sufficiently uh, clean electricity, I will go down this, uh, this way. Um, so, so again, CO2 utilization and renewable uh, deployment uh, have to go hand in hand. And, and they have to go a long way hand in hand because we will need a lot of additional electricity to do so. So to put these numbers for those people that don't work in petawatt hours every day, so we end up here with eight, about 18 petawatt hours um, and that corresponds is 75% of the current global electricity demand just to decarbonize the chemical industry. So this is critical. This is what Marco mentioned, we need a lot of electricity. What is also important is that it's not only the chemical industry that is waiting for renewable energy. So what we, compa we can compare the efficiency, how we, how we can use renewable electricity to decarbonize uh, chemicals um, in other sectors. And what I showed here are lines, for example, doing power to heat or doing power to mobility. And what you see is that these lines are steeper. That means I use, I need less electricity to have the same carbon reduction. So we have to know that power to chemicals is intrinsic, is very often less efficient than power to heat and power to mobility. So in this 
competition to, to employ the uh, renewable electricity in, a, in an efficient way for climate change mitigation, the power to chemicals comes very late. I want to point out there is some hope and that's why Andrea and Miele showed formic acid because formic acid is, for example, an example where the, where's the high potential and um, to, employ, uh, to switch to CO2 utilization. And the CO2 polymers are an example that are even uh, off the chart because I do not uh, need much uh, additional electricity. Okay, so we know about the difficulties of um, employing CO2 utilization. What about the other carbon loops that I've been discussing? So what you see here is the results, and now it's for 2050 and the plastics for using CO2 utilization. And what I showed you before is this very much depends upon um, the carbon footprint of the electricity, which we varied in, in this um, here for, between the extreme case, I assume it's for free um, to an upper value of 200 grams per kilowatt hour. So, and basically um, this covers the whole range for CO2 utilization um, saying again, there's a threshold and it, and it really relies on having um, low carbon electricity. What is interesting, I think, is the other options. So if you can really upscale chemical, re, uh, mechanical and chemical recycling of uh, um, polymers, we can also reduce carbon emissions a lot. Um, and the same holds for, for biomass in principle, it has the option. What is, and then I think we have to overcome the idea to say either I'm a CCU person, I'm a biomass person or a recycling person, but then we looked at an integrated model saying uh, all options are on the table. So pick the ones that uh, you like best to minimize the CO2 emissions. And by this, you can increase the carbon um, uh, reductions even more. And you can find synergies. For example, in the biomass uh, processes, we emit CO2 that then can be employed for CO2 utilization processes. And if you look at the analysis, you will find an interesting point that we will need, uh, that I want to point out for the LCA people, and I think it's, it's been touched upon before. If you employ standard LCA models, you will end up being even carbon negative. And that's, that's because uh, uh, the treatment, uh, we assume that we cannot do recycle everything, but there's a residual 6% of plastics that will end up in landfill. And standard LCA practice says um, that there's very little emissions in, attached to this. So overall, what do you see? So large um, circular, circular carbon could lead to large reductions. It could even lead towards net zero, or if you do the standard LCA analysis, assuming that it's uh, uh, looking only at 100 years, actually that's what's in there, it, it leads to net uh, zero uh, emissions. So it's very close, or the residual part would have been, would to be carried out by CCS. What's the price you need to pay? You need a lot of clean electricity for um, CO2 utilization I show, or for biomass, I need also a lot of feedstock. So basically in this uh, world, we have a two, we have basically in this circular cycles, we have two sources of energy that we would employ. It's either the electricity to do the water splitting or the biomass, which contains not only the carbon, but also the energy. And we need to benchmark this to the energy that uh, we employ today in the chemical industry. So what you see shown here, that's fossil energy. And this includes not only the energy in electricity and heating we need in the chemical industry, but also the um, fossil energy contained in the fossil carbon feedstocks. And if you compare this to the circular carbon foot uh, pathways by either employing biomass or by employing um, CO2 utilization, what you see is that taking this whole energy perspective um, that we would roughly really double the energy demand of the chemical industry today. So this would be uh, an enormous change um, and an enormous requirement and we've seen the number for the electricity. What is interesting is if you if we would emphasize going for um, recycling and we pushed here recycling to the um, maximum a mechanical recycling and also allowing chemical recycling to monomers, that actually the projection is if you could maximize um, chemical recycling, you might even end up um, using less um, energy than we are using today. And you end up with something like a Pareto frontier, 
uh, where you can kind of switch, do I want to go from biomass or do I want to see C, uh, CO2 utilization? As you see, there's some synergy in going in between with the total energy content uh, you uh, need to do. So this is a positive note, I would say, for um, going for um, that thinking about the circular terms might even be promising um, overall. But how does it compare to CO, uh, CCS? Now, obviously, the other way is that Marco has been pointing out going to CCS could also be an option. And this, for this, I want to add this to this diagram and saying, how would this work if I used, instead of producing CCU chemicals, go to CCS? And again, the slopes are the steeper, the better you are. And what you can clearly see in here, I put in, in another diagram, what Marco has been showing, if our sole objective is to decarbonize the chemical industry, um, we can do so with much less energy needs by going for CCS than by go, um, then going to CO2 utilization. So power to chemicals, um, except a very few examples, is intrinsically less efficient. So that's a challenge. And that's also true for the diagram I've been just showing to you. And I think I should speed up. That's obviously, if you want to minimize energy demand, it's also in this case compared to biomass and recycling. If you com would combine fossil plus recycling plus CCS, we could, we could minimize um, the, the impacts, uh, the energy demands um, of this zero, net zero world. So what do we pick? And I think we are not finished here. Because in the whole presentation, um, and I just want to point out money-wise, you see the same thing, but I skipped this in the presentation. Um, but we also have to take a bro broader picture. And the broader picture is, as I said, it's money, it's infrastructure, um, and it's all local availability, and it's also environmental trade-offs. So what I plotted here is based on the energy supplies, is I, we looked at different environmental impacts, not uh, for this um, net zero um, um, assumptions, and we normalized it for the fossil case. And what you, what you see is that um, biomass would, as shown, increase land occupation, but also other environmental impacts like eutrophication. If we go for CO2 utilization, we have much increase in metal depletions. And if you do the analysis, you find that basically there's not one solution that dominates this Pareto uh, multi-objective uh, optimization problem but actually the Pareto optimal uh, solutions are biomass CO2 and some fossil, plus really deploying recycling. So I think what we have to do is to work on regional concepts where we have for the different sources, um, uh, the demand and supply to bring this into the balance. And I think a big issue is then also public acceptance because um, our societies in the, in the end have to decide which, uh, which technologies they want to employ and whether they're willing to invest and uh, will not willing to invest. Okay, with this, I think I have to conclude and I thank you for the, your attention. Thank you, Andre. Thanks for uh, your presentation. Uh, in fact, there are, uh, we are collecting several questions that probably we can move to the final discussion. I, I will pick up just one for uh, specifically for you. And uh, we have one question asking uh, if uh, when you consider, let's say, s uh, analysis uh, for different products, uh, you are actually also considering uh, the, the market demand for products. So, so for instance, uh, you are, uh, let's say, proposing formic acid, but is there a demand for it? Yeah, there is a demand for formic acid. Um, in, in, uh, but it's like, it's like um, 800,000 tons, maybe a million tons. It, it's used uh, in the agriculture industry. So, uh, so I think no, no, you, will, you will not save the world by going to formic acid, A. Eh? And I think Andrea made a really nice point saying, um, and if you, prop if you saw my analysis and say, oh, formic acid seems like a great idea. It's only a great idea if you use it in a specific, in as formic acid, you need this chemical structure. If you want to use it as a fuel or as hydrogen storage, then you need to benchmark it against hydrogen storage. And then it's, it's I give a short version, it's a really bad idea um, because it's really difficult. That's why you can save so much because it's difficult to, put, to produce formic acid. So that's why I can save so much. Yeah, um, but so in general, so in formic acid is not in the polymer supply chain. It was just shown as an example. Um, but here we showed the, uh, yes, we included the, um, 
the demands and the demand projections for the futures of plastics in the presentation. Thank you. Uh, I will leave the other questions uh, for the, the final discussion. So Panos, uh, uh, you can take the lead now. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks all the panelists. Yep. Okay, thank you. I guess you well uh, first of all I would like to thank all uh, the the speakers for the very interesting uh, presentations uh, I've just uh, uh, developed uh, four slides trying to summarize uh, the the essence uh, from each uh, presentation and then try to uh, to make some uh, a couple of comments uh, and uh, end up with a final conclusion so we've seen systems engineering and how systems engineering can be actually helpful in uh, solving the uh, CO2 capture and utilization problem. Uh, Nile showed us that we have to go from molecular design to uh, uh, for new materials and uh, uh, from uh, solvents to membranes, whatever, to, uh, but also going up to the infrastructure revolution. Uh, all of the speakers have uh, mentioned that it's a thermodynamically uphill process to utilize CO2. And uh, however, there are a big palette of uh, tools uh, from systems engineering, from design optimization, but also to scheduling and planning in order to uh, make it uh, more efficient. And uh, life cycle assessment is a, is a very good tool as uh, more than one of the speakers uh, mentioned in order to uh, to judge uh, whether your uh, uh, solution is uh, viable. Uh, net zero emissions in the chemical industry. Uh, Andrea uh, uh, told us that we have, a, we have to investigate a multi-scenario. Uh, uh, we have to do the investigation on multiple scenario and uh, take a good care of the overall balance, not to miss something. We need physical permanent uh, uh, capture and also have to take into account all the uh, indirect uh, uh, CO2 emissions. It's also a multiple stakeholder issue that uh, we have to, 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 to consider. And uh, energy, the use of energy and where this energy comes from and also the, all the transportation for infrastructure are very critical factors in the CCU. Uh, I, in, uh, uh, net zero emissions in, uh, in, in, in industry. Uh, Matteo, well, sorry, sorry, uh, Marco uh, uh, told us about uh, mitigation but also negative emission solutions and uh, it's uh, important to do the evaluation uh, of technologies for, for chemicals. The carbon intensity of electricity as also uh, Andre mentioned uh, Land use, that's also very important. Storage, op storage options are very critical in order to, to judge uh, of uh, technologies, but it's important to, uh, the, is to identify where improvement, improvements are needed and where a new technology has to be uh, developed in order to make each uh, solution uh, viable. And of course, a European-wide approach is, is uh, quite important on this one. And, uh, how about renewables in the chemical industry? Uh, I think what Andre told us at the end is uh, they have to go hand by hand with uh, uh, new developments in uh, not developing of new chemistry or actually utilizing uh, uh, chemical pathways that can uh, provide uh, uh, energy that otherwise could be lost in, in order to, to go to the uh, utilization. LCA, very nice uh, example here. Uh, Nile also mentioned it, and from cradle to grave in order to, to, to judge the uh, efficiency of each approach. Uh, renewable electricity is very critical. Uh, so uh, there is a, 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 a pathway to this one. I think in Europe, I think uh, the penetration of uh, renewable electricity is quite large. And also, uh, Integration of technologies, that's very important. We have to see all the, all the uh, available technologies and try to, to utilize uh, the benefits from each one of those. Carbon singular economy closes the whole cycle. Uh, very nice example with all this, uh, the, the polymer recycling, uh, 
and um, I think that will give a lot of ideas to many of uh, people in the audience. So, final remarks. Uh, uh, we have to define clearly the, the question because the, the solution will depend on uh, uh, which way we would like to, to move. Uh, we are facing, however, a multi-dimensional, multi-scale problem, and of course we have multiple criteria. So it's uh, uh, well, engineers at the end uh, they have to uh, to work under uh, uh, this uh, pr big pressure in this multi-dimensional uh, uh, spaces. But uh, uh, there we go. That's the, the, the big challenge, and uh, of course there is a way to go. However, the, the clock is uh, is is ticking, and uh, we don't have much time. So we need to. Uh, to uh, have all our creativity in order to provide uh, the best uh, solutions. Well, thank you everybody for the for the, your attendance. Of course, uh, the uh, like to to also thank European Federation of Chemical Engineers for giving this opportunity to uh, to have such a very interesting webinar. I think uh, some more questions may pop up, and uh, we can, we have some more time, Fabrizio, to take care of those. Okay, I will uh, try to select some. Uh, well, I, in fact, I, I have one uh, uh, specific for Andrea, which is, in my opinion, <laughs> quite a difficult question, which is, uh, why do you think uh, LCA studies are so limited uh, in a way? Uh, why are there so many contradictions uh, and what uh, can we do to improve them? You know, LCA studies are, are not as different of any type of, of modeling that you do. So it's all in the assumptions <laughs> and, and I think, and, and in the data that you put in. And I think the problem we have with comparison of LCAs, as well as comparison of cost assessments, it's not only limited to technical, to life cycle assessment, is the half the assumptions are not transparently published. Why is the goal of the study? Why do you want to do an LCA? That's, that's one of the first questions in any LCA methodology ISO guidelines, establish the goal of your study and keep it, you know, through the full study, sometimes not even publish. What kind of assumptions did I do? What is in and, so my, in and outside my business, you know, my, my system boundaries? Why? The justification is, is oh, People go very fast over these kind of things and then give you a result. And if you don't know those assumptions, if you don't understand the system boundaries, if you don't understand how the technology, so for instance, assuming I'm using uh, a wind power, but I'm telling you whether my electricity is continuous or whether I have a battery system or whether I'm assuming it's from a wind power, but somebody has made it magically continuous in my door and it has no energy penalty or cost. So, I think it's, it's, um, we need to get used to, to be more transparent in the reporting and to actually allow people to follow the decision makings that have been done here or whether it's an integrated assessment model or whether it's a techno-economic analysis so that people can actually use your results in a better way. I love what we do today, actually people pick. That's what we do. We pick the, the LCS that are convenient and leave the others outside or the costs that are convenient and we need to improve in there. That's not helpful. So that's, that would be my, I don't know. I, I, I saw Naira saying yes and Andrea as well. So <laughs> I, I assume it's a consensus. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. I and think maybe, uh, can I just at one point, yeah, I sure. agree with everything Andrea said and, but I think I want to stress one point. It's the same is true for the cost analysis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think LCA uh, is is because it's standardized. It's actually sometimes even more transparent than uh, than cost analysis. I would say, and there are some guidelines out there. Um, yeah. And we've been working on. Andrea has been computing for the um, European um, uh, Commission so, uh, on standardizing LCAs and in particular standardizing assumptions. And I think that would be something that would be really helpful. Uh, like for CCS, everybody was D studying DOE case 10, uh, the plant or something. So uh, I think s standardized scenarios would already be enormously helpful. And uh, just to add, and sorry that we're going to ping pong, I think people, we need to stop doing the tech, the plan design, the techno-economic analysis, and then the LCA as, as different studies, as isolated studies. 
Assumptions you take in your plan design will affect your economics and your LCA. Assumptions you take in your LCA are going to, affine, to affect, you can affect your plan design. So the fact that you keep working in silos, that doesn't work anymore because the system is too complex and because we are designing new systems. So we need chemical engineers <laughs> or life cycle analysis that actually work together and understand and design and do the basis of design together so that the studies actually can be compared what you get for cost and what you get for your LCA, and that's not always the case. Thank you. Uh, can, I, can I add on this one, one point? I agree yeah, with sure, Marco. Andrea and Andre. Um, I would also advocate, because LCA, if you do it right, as, as you do, guys, and uh, very important, it's very complex, and you need a lot of input information, you know, the, uh, I advocate for the use of a simplified LCA that uh, allows to account for the key effects and to kind of identify ballpark figures and uh, um, the major effects. And that could be the starting point for a more detailed and uh, um, uh, detailed LCA analysis that comes next and that is applied only to the solutions that uh, achieve the purposes that you, that you have. Can I reply? <laughs> I agree. <laughs> well, I, I, will, I, I agree. And I think that the part of the problem is that you try to do a full LCA, you know, for a TRL9, but for a TRL3. And it doesn't work because of the lack of, you know, data and knowledge and a scenario. So you need to adapt the LCA to the kind of data and the purpose of the study. And if you are very early on technology development, you want to identify bottlenecks. You are not interested in the third decimal point in the LCA, that is, that, that's nonsense. You, there are too many assumptions. You, you want to identify where the system shifts, what is important, what is bottleneck, what makes your you know, figures go steep or not steep. That's, that's what you want to do. And as you get more data, then you, and the technology develops, then you go into, you know, the more detail and the decimal begins to play a role, but not very early. Okay, maybe one or two last questions. Very, there is one and that is also quite generic. Uh, we are possibly all panelists, so may have an opinion. That is, uh, considering the intermittent nature of uh, several uh, renewable sources uh, for power, uh, what do you think uh, is the actual contribution of uh, those sources, uh, I'd say especially for CCU, but also for CCS? Who wants to, to start first? Well, I, I have two PhD students looking into that. Uh, okay, <laughs> so, we are so. Just, so we are just starting into it, but we're looking at it in a, in a different way. So assuming you will have renewables, is there any service that new chemical process can deliver to the grid? And if that is so, and that is a question, how will the process, the, the design of the process look like? The problem is if you just take what is today and keep it inflexible and then try to adjust to a new reality. So, do we need to design process in different way? Do we need more modularity? Do we need more flexible separation processes that will allow you to increase somehow? And what is the cost of that? Because it won't be for free. So is there a business case for that industry that is providing a service to the grid? So those are the kind of questions I, I don't have the answer. Well, <laughs> we are looking into it, as I think uh, Andrea and Marco and also Nilay. Um, is not as straightforward as I just assume it will be a service because at this moment there is no market for that. So why will an industry operate in that way? So and can be done, you know, the more uh, large scale optimized you are, the less flexible you are at some point. Other comments on this? No, last one. I think that, maybe, ah, so, sorry. Just shortly. And, and you again have to benchmark yourselves not against, uh, against future other storage technologies, huh? because I think, again, the chemical industry um, oversizing and redesigning and uh, the chemical plants might, might turn out to be costly from what I've seen. Uh, and 
Yeah, so, so you, you have, again have to picture your benchmarks in the right way. Yeah. Okay. And uh, possibly the, the, the last one, uh, uh, which is uh, two-folded in a way, it is about uh, photosynthesis. On the one side, uh, uh, the question is, uh, I mean, since uh, we already have, let's say, a natural way for capturing CO2, why don't we simply use that uh, and that's all? And the, the other one is a bit, uh, let's say, more long-sighted in a way. Uh, why don't we try to, to do that, I mean, photosynthesis artificially and solve the problem in that way? Who wants uh, to give an opinion about that, uh, if any? But, but that's, in a sense, uh, the CCU scenario, some people call this artificial leaves, huh? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because uh, there's different there's different types of integration. Huh? But if you assume um, that your renewable electricity comes from photovoltaics, yeah, there's some systems that say that that's a, that's you decompose it. You don't do it in one reactor. Yeah, but um, I, so I have electricity. I have the water electrolyzer, and then I do the chemistry. And you can combine this together. But uh, on this page, I'm with Marco. Basically, the same th things hold true. That's why also I also emphasize thermodynamics. Yeah, you're still challenged with, with the phase that you're trying to invert combustion at this point. Yeah. So, so um, in, in that sense, I think um, some, some of the specificities might, might change if, if you look at integrated reactors. But I think um, this, this first order estimate that Marco was advocating um, will be very similar to the CCU, what we've seen and shown. Okay. Marco, do you have further comments on this? Uh... Well, if you talk about artificial photosynthesis, photosynthesis, there is a big uh, center at Caltech that has been working on these things for more than 10 years, uh, led by um, Nate Lewis and then by uh, Atwater. And I think if one wants to know what the state of research uh, in that domain is, uh, one should look at what they have uh, achieved there. And in terms of um, um, exploiting biomass, um, of course, one, one possibility is that of afforestation, reforestation, I mean, it's, it's not my area. Um, I understand that there is a lot of potential, but it's also limited. Uh, certainly, we need to do that, but it's, uh, it's not enough. In terms of uh, generating negative emissions, um, uh, we have these two possibilities that I mentioned, so capturing CO2 from air using chemical means, let's say, or exploiting uh, the natural capture by biomass. And um, when you look at the scenarios of IPCC, we see that uh, they uh, attribute a, a great importance to in quantitative terms, uh, to both to backs and ducks. I think that it's still unclear whether, this, whether the need that we have in terms of uh, bioenergy and CCS uh, can be matched by, by the potential out there. And uh, I would say that this is an active area of, um, of research. Um, so it's very important that we look at biomass, absolutely. Uh, whether that we can solve all the problems with biomass, frankly, I doubt. Thank you. I don't know if uh, perhaps there was a question from Matteo. Um. I think in the, in the interest of time, we can conclude because we oh, are okay. many minutes behind you. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so that's all. I would like to thank also on behalf uh, of uh, uh, Matteo and Panos, uh, all the speakers, uh, Nilay, Andrea, uh, Marco and Andre. Thanks very much for uh, your great contribution today. And uh, thanks, of course, uh, to all people uh, who attended. As I wrote in the chat, uh, uh, we are recording uh, this webinar and uh, it will be published uh, on the uh, EFC uh, website. So thanks again. Thanks very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.